For those of you who, who are new and visiting and are wondering why I'm back up here, uh, we have two pastors at our church. Uh, one is our lead pastor, Pastor Kenny Keating, and he is a full-time firefighter, and so he's at the firehouse today. I am our second pastor. I am going to do all of the things today because we've got one pastor today. Um, so if you're sick of me by the end, trust me, I am too. Come back another week. There'll be more di diversity up here. It'll be great. Um, well, most of you know, many of you know, um, that I am a new mom. Uh, I think I still count as a new mom. My daughter is 13 months. It's still new. I mean, especially compared to some of you. It's very new. Um, but however it happens, the algorithms of the interwebs and social media um, have just begun really curating all content for me and just like sending me all mom things all mom things. It's all centered around motherhood. Just a constant barrage of how to make your own baby food and which car seat is the best choice and, and teaching you how to gentle parent and then teaching you how to make fun of gentle parenting. It's all of the things. And most of it is just a lot of noise. And a lot of it just makes a lot of moms feel really guilty a lot of the time that they're not doing it this way or that way. So I just, as a general practice, try to ignore most of it. But one post I saw recently that wasn't specifically geared towards tired new moms, and yet as a tired new mom, it hit home for me. Um, I, it really made me what the kids call LOL, which the rest of us know really means silently smile, <laughs> right? None of us are actually laughing out loud at these things. But this is, this is kind of the thing. So, so it's a TikTok, but I'm an elder millennial, so I saw it on Instagram because I don't have TikTok. Um, but this is, this is how it goes. It's one of those videos where like it's audio that's plugged in, you know? Do you know what I'm talking about? If you don't, it's fine. You'll get the idea. So the clip is of a woman and she's on the phone with a friend and she tells her friend, I'm just feeling really down lately and I just don't know why. And her friend says, her friend and her have this exchange. It goes like this. Have you exercised today? No. Did you go outside? No. Did you talk to anyone? No. Did you eat well? No. Did you limit your scrolling time? No. Did you make any plans? No. Did you drink enough water? No. Did you get enough sleep? No. And then the friend says, wow, what a mystery. <laughs> this one hit me. I was watching it and I was like, no, 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 no. Oh, I'm exhausted. No wonder I'm so exhausted and feel disconnected from the world. I feel like most of us, whether we are a new mom or not, can relate to this kind of humor, right? We know what's good for us. And yet, for some reason, it's so hard to do those things regularly. It is so easy to neglect doing the things that are good for us, whether it's making time to go and do something fun with friends or get up out of our seat and move our bodies or drink more water, whatever it might be. And I've been really feeling this in this season of being a mother of a young child. But here's the reality. I felt this long before Naya came into the picture. I just have a much better excuse for it now, right? But it was true. I still struggled to do the things that were good for me. I just now have a cute little tiny person to blame it on, and everyone has grace for me, and I have grace for myself because she's a lot to handle, and she's very cute. But all these issues were true long before she came into the picture. It is very easy to neglect the, the very things that are good for us. And so while I am constantly annoyed by all the mom span, and I'm trying to trick the algorithm into thinking there's more to me than just being a mom, it's not going well, I don't appreciate the guilt trips by the people who act like they've got it all together, right? But what I can appreciate, what I do find helpful, are, are the helpful reminders and the nudges towards health that I can get from some of these. Just helpful reminders. This one, although it was funny, it was a helpful for, reminder for me. I thought, oh, I, I do need to exercise, and I'll probably feel better if I make some plans, and I'll probably feel better if I get a little bit more hydrated, and so on. And so this morning, as someone who doesn't take herself too seriously, my hope is that we would all hopefully be reminded a little bit this morning about some things that are good for us, and be nudged a little bit more towards spiritual health, without feeling guilty like anyone has got this down or any of us are doing this perfectly, and that all of, the reminder that all of us need a little bit of refocusing every now and then. Amen? Amen? So this morning, I want to invite you to pull out your Bibles, whether it's paper or an app. If you don't have either of those things, that's okay. Uh, the core text will be on the screen for you this morning. But we do want to encourage you to bring your Bibles or pull out your app. 
Um, we're going to be in the book of 2 Kings, um, which it's been a while since we've jumped into the Old Testament. You guys feeling like brushing off the Old Testament a little bit? Yeah. Great, great. Why not? Most of you don't care. You're just like, just tell me something. So we're going to be in the book of first, 2 Kings, <coughs> excuse me, and we're going to read a story this morning about a time when a people that were nicknamed the people of the book neglected and eventually lost the book. And more importantly, we're going to be looking at how finding it and remembering it and reorienting towards it created a national, cultural, and communal revival. And so our story is going to begin in the book of 2 Kings chapter 22, if you want to turn there. The story takes place in the kingdom of Judah, which is the southern kingdom in the divided kingdom of Israel. The year is about 640 B.C., and a new king of Judah is crowned. He is an eight-year-old, and his name is Josiah. If this was a movie, we'd have this intro scene, right, with this little eight-year-old boy being crowned king, and then it would flash back, and it would give us some context to understand how we got there. So that's what we're going to do right now. I'm going to give us a brief, a very brief run-through um, to bring us up to speed of how we got to an eight-year-old king named Josiah. So the people of Israel, as we learn in the Old Testament, were called by God, a God who has named himself as Yahweh. They, they've been called to be a community through which God would make his name and his character and his love for the world known to the world. They were meant to be this contrast community. While the world was living one way, they would live in line with the way of the king of creation, Yahweh, and the world around them would learn what life looks like under the care of the good king. And so he gives them, uh, he rescues them from Egypt and he brings them out into the wilderness and in the wilderness, he creates a covenant with them. It's basically a relational contract with them, most akin to what we know of as marriage. It's between the people of Israel and God. And he basically lays out this covenant for them where he says, I'm inviting you into a new way of living. If you live this way that I'm inviting you to live, the world is going to see you and the way that you live and they will know me. And through you, not only will you be blessed by being obedient to this covenant, but the whole world will end up being blessed if you do this. And in return... I will be your God and you will be my people and I will fight for you and I will rescue you and I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Even if you fail, I will relentlessly pursue you with my love and draw you back to myself. And Yahweh says, I do. And the people say, I do. And they're married and it's this beautiful thing. The story of the Old Testament, if you're familiar with it or not, <coughs> is the story of how this God holds up his end of the deal. It's the story of the unrelenting, unfailing faithfulness of God in the midst of and in response to incredible unfaithfulness on behalf of the people. And so God, over and over again, he's faithful to them, he rescues them, he draws them back to himself, he tries to remind them and reform them and reshape them and reorient them to the truth of what it looks like to live under the care of the good Good king, how much blessing and freedom and flourishing and wholeness exists when we live within that relationship. And the people of Israel, they come back and they fall away and they come back and they fall away. And we see this cycle perpetuated throughout the Old Testament. They reject him over and over again. They go their own way over and over again. They grow in pride. They rely on themselves, their own instincts, their own intuition, their own egos over and over again. They trust in themselves and they trust in the foreign gods all around them. They look to gods that they can see, that they can put their hands on, uh, to look, look to for safety and security and to provide for them. And so they're incredibly unfaithful. And by the time we get to 922 BC, God's chosen people who are meant to live lives that display the goodness of their King Yahweh loving God and loving one another and creating a ripple effect through all of humanity to, to bring healing and wholeness and flourishing to the world, now they've turned on each other and they divide into two separate kingdoms. So I'm giving you some visuals this morning in case that's helpful for you. This is the United Kingdom of Israel when God establishes them as a kingdom. 
And by 922, they've turned on each other so much that they split into two kingdoms. You've got the kingdom of Israel in the north and the kingdom of Judah in the south. So this people of God that are meant to be living in such harmony with each other, such love for each other, learning to live out the rhythms of the kingdom of heaven on earth as it is in heaven, they've fallen so far that not only are they unfaithful to Yahweh, but they split and they turn against each other. Are you with me? Things are not good, are they? Things are not going well. Things only to continue to, continue to get worse from there. You can see um, on here, um, in case you can't read the print, the red is, says evil. Uh, in the northern kingdom of Israel, you can see that every king was evil. All of them were evil. They established these kings. All of them were evil. They all did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They led the people astray. They fostered the, this, uh, this heart of rebellion and turning to other gods and worshiping idols and pride and arrogance and all of this. All of the kings of Israel went astray and led the people of Israel astray. In the southern kingdom, it wasn't much better, but out of 20 kings, 12 of them were evil, so over 50%. And a king named Manasseh was the worst. So at the bottom there on the side of Judah, it might be too small for you to see, but that last good is a king named Hezekiah. He tried to bring the people back to the heart of Yahweh. His son Manasseh undid all of that and made it worse than ever. During Manasseh's reign, he basically undoes all of the good that his father, King Hezekiah, did. He not only turns people away from Yahweh again, but he, he, he makes it worse than ever. He institutes a ton of idolatry. He erects all kinds of uh, um, uh, altars to false gods like Baal and Asherah. He made what is referred to as a detestable idol, which we don't have exact idea of what it was. But he makes this detestable idol, and he puts it in the temple of Yahweh. The temple is this sacred, holy place meant to house the one true king, the one true God, wholly set apart, and he fills it with other idols, and Yahweh is just one of many. He encourages the people to worship all of the false gods, builds altar to them, he consults mediums and spiritists, and he himself follows and institutes the religion of Moloch, which is basically the way you would worship Moloch is through child sacrifice. They would sacrifice children in the fire to worship Moloch. This is about as bad as it can be. I'm not sure if any of us can imagine a more uh, uh, a, a plummet ending in depravity worse than sacrificing children in the fire, right? This is bad. Needless to say, Manasseh took a people with a history of falling away from God, a propensity to wander, and plunged them back into idolatry, wickedness, and all kinds of evil, including maybe the most evil we could imagine. His son, Ammon, who's just below him, just continued to perpetuate uh, the lineage of his father and evil, evil, evil. In 640 BC, Ammon dies. And his son is eight years old and gets crowned king. And his name is Josiah. What color is Josiah on there? It's white. Guys, it's going to get better. The story's going to get better. Okay? If you're like, wow, this is the most depressing message I've ever heard. It's going to get better. <laughs> so King Josiah is eight years old. And the kingdom that he has inherited is so far away from the people that God was intending to establish. Their hearts have been turned so far away from Yahweh in such deplorable, evil, wicked ways um, that he has his work cut out for him. I'm not even sure if the people at the time knew how bad things were because it became just such a part of their culture, the idea that a fish doesn't know that they're in water, right? These things were just normal. It was normal to go and worship these idols. It was normal to walk into the temple and see an array of gods and choose that day which one you were going to worship and sacrifice to. This was a normal part of their culture. Their culture and their traditions and their rituals had been so infused by this rebellious evilness uh, that they, they maybe didn't even know how bad it had gotten. But somehow, the book of 2 Kings records that Josiah, King Josiah at eight years old, he has a desire to please the Lord. There's something in him that desires to know the way of Yahweh and to please the Lord. In, the 18th year, in his 18th year as king, so he would be about 26 years old, he begins a restoration project for the temple. He decides to restore the temple. It's probably in 
<clears throat> in, in disarray, and it's clearly filled with other gods and idols, <clears throat> and it's been destroyed in some parts. And so he starts this project to repair and restore the house of the Lord after it had been defiled and neglected for generations. He sends the court secretary, a man named Shaphan, to the temple to go and says, go and connect with the high priest that's there. There's a high priest. Go connect with Hilkiah, the high priest, and here are some things I want you to do in this restoration project. Uh, Shaphan says, okay, I'll go, goes and meets with Hilkiah. As they meet about this restoration project, are you guys with me? Are you getting bored yet? Okay. Okay. As they're connecting about this restoration project, Hilkiah, the high priest, uh, who clearly, you know, hasn't been walking with Yahweh, is like, hey, as we were repairing the temple, I found this book. I found this book, the book of the law, this thing we've heard about, this book of the law. Now, they're in the temple, the people of the book, and he's like, hey, as we were cleaning up, I found the book of the law. Do you think this is a big deal? It's a huge deal that this thing was lost, and that casually they've stumbled upon it, like maybe we should show the king we found this book. This is, they're not in good shape, right? And so <laughs> while cleaning the temple, Hilkiah finds it. Maybe it's in some back storage room that they're cleaning out. And so Shaphan says, okay, give me the book. I'll go and update the king about the restoration project and I'll let him know about this book. <clears throat> and so he goes. Almost as an afterthought, Shaphan says, you know, oh, you know, the restoration project is going well. We did this, we did this. Also, Hilkiah found this book, and he begins to read the book to King Josiah, 26 years old. 2 Kings 22, 11 says, when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. If you're unfamiliar with this uh, this ritual, to tear your clothes is just the sign of, it's, it's an outward expression of tearing your heart, like broken in repentance, just so undone with grief that the only way that you can process the, the, the type of repentance that you feel is necessary for the moment is to just rip your clothes in sorrow and anguish. I'm okay, thank you. <clears throat> And so he rips his clothes, he breaks down in repentance and grief and mourning over what he's just heard. What, he, what he's been read is, is likely the Torah, probably the book of Deuteronomy as we've come to know it. And he hears about this covenant that Yahweh cut with the people of Israel and this promise to be faithful. And through the relationship with Yahweh, he would bless them and bring about flourishing and healing and wholeness in such a way that it would spread through the world. And Josiah must be thinking about the state of his nation, a divided Israel, the south of which he is now responsible for, that they're literally clearing false gods out of the temple so far from the heart of God, so far from this picture that he's discovered in the book of the law that he can't even believe how far they've fallen and he's destroyed. He's devastated. When Josiah hears the word of the Lord, he repents and he responds. And so let's look at chapter 23. This is a lot, so I've just tried to summarize it for you, but now we're gonna read the actual text. We're going to read chapter 23, verse 1 through 3 together, and as we read this section, I'm going to invite you to stand, and if you're new, let me tell you why real quick. We stand here for the reading of the word, not because we think that something magical happens when we get off of our butts and stand up, but it's a way of embodying the practice that we're hoping, hoping to open ourselves up to, and so by standing up, we're waking our body up in the way that we're hoping to wake our mind and our spirit up, and we're paying attention to the words of God's word in a way that, that gives them um, the weightiness that they deserve in saying that of all of the words we hear today, the words of the Lord are the most important. And so we're going to stand in attention um, and give our attention to it. Amen? So I want to invite you to stand up. Read with me from verse 1, 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 1 through 3. It says, so the king, <coughs> the king sent messengers... Oh, sorry, you don't have to read it out loud. Sorry. Read it silently while I read it aloud. You know what? You're grown-ups. Do what you want. If you want to read it out loud, I'm okay with it. So the king sent messengers, and they gathered all the elders of Judah and Jeru Jerusalem to him. Hear this. They gathered all the elders from Judah and Jerusalem to him. Then the king went to the Lord's temple 
with all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, as well as the priests and the prophets, all the people from the youngest to the oldest. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the Lord's temple. Next, the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant in the Lord's presence to follow the Lord and to keep his commands, his decrees, and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul in order to carry out the words of this covenant that were written in this book and all the people agreed to the covenant. Sorry, I didn't let you follow along on there. All the people agreed to the covenant. You may be seated. So upon hearing the word of the Lord, Josiah is moved, not just to repent and feel sorrowful, but he is moved to act in a way that is proportionate to what he has heard. He calls everyone together from the youngest to the oldest. He calls everyone for whom he is responsible for and in leadership over. He calls them all together and he reads to them what he had just been read and not only is, does he respond by cutting a new covenant and recommitting himself and the people to whom he's been entrusted, but all of the people respond. They are so moved by what they've heard in the word of God that they respond in kind. But this, re this repentance, this recommitting to the covenant, the renewal of their vows to Yahweh, it has to be more than words, right? Their kingdom, their practices, the culture that they have now curated for themselves, their priorities, what they value, what they put their faith in and their hope in, all of this looks nothing like what has been described in the reading of the word of God. It looks nothing like the people that God was attempting to establish in the Torah. If Josiah were to hold up their culture and their practices and their ways of living against what they've just read in the word of God, the way that they were intended to live, the contrast would have been stark. Josiah likely re would have mo had this moment of realization as a leader, we can't actually be these people that this book is describing without changing all of this. There is some whole life reform that needs to happen in response to what we have just read. We cannot continue to live this way and be these people. It doesn't work. It's in direct con contradiction to each other. They had been formed into a people that looked nothing like the people of God, both by outward things being imposed on them and also by the things that they chose to embrace. And so in order to truly recommit themselves to this covenant, they would need to be reformed by the words of the word of the law, by the words of Yahweh. And so the story goes on from verse 4 through the rest of this chapter. If we were to read it together, which we don't have time to do this morning, but if you want to just like watch like an like a ancient text version of like a live action movie, you want to read the rest of this chapter? The story goes on, and the king, um, I'm just going to blow through it for you guys. It says, the king commanded the high priest Hilkiah and the priests of the second rank and the doorkeepers to bring out of the Lord's sanctuary all the articles made for Baal and Asherah and all the stars in the sky. He burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron. He carried their ashes to, Be to Bethel. Then he did away with the idolatrous priests who had burned incense to them. He brought out the Asherah poles from the Lord's temple, burned it, beat it to dust, tore down the houses of the male cult prostitutes that were in the Lord's temple. And then it says in verse 8, he brought all the priests and that had defiled, sorry, <coughs> brought all the priests from the cities of Judah and he defiled the high places. He not only burned down the, the idols and ground them to dust, he not only tore down the altars, he then defiled them so that they couldn't even use them again. 
He burns it, he beats it to, he beats those things to dust also. He defiles this, he defiles that so that no one could do this. He defiles the altars to Moloch so that they could no longer offer child sacrifices on it. I mean, he's just ripping everything down. Do you see it? Can you feel it? Just like tearing things down, beating it to dust, throwing out the dust, burning this thing, setting this on fire. I mean, it is whole nationwide cultural reform. He tore down all of these altars, this one, that one, the altars that Manasseh, his grandfather, had made in the Lord's temple, smashed them, defiled more high places, tore them down. It just goes on and on. Removed all the shrines from the high places, slaughtered on the altars all the priests who carried out these actions. He reinstitutes Passover, which hadn't been done in generation after generation after generation. This remembering of how God called them out of Egypt and rescued them in order to make them a people of his own. He reinstitutes Passover so that they would regularly remember what God had done. In summary, in response to God's word, Josiah purged the lands of the idols so the things that they had placed their security and their hope in. He then destroyed and defiled the altars, the places where those things, where the idols would have been honored, and then did away with these systems of worship, meaning he changed the whole religion and the culture of their people. Do you think that this was an easy change for the people of Judah? He's literally like, it's all got to go. He is so moved by the remembrance of the God of Israel and the invitation to live out lives that are not only blessed by being in covenant with the creator God, but that literally the purpose is to be a blessing to the whole world. He's so moved by this reminder that he wants to get back to there as fast as he can. And so he levels it. And he's like, we got to start over. We've got to reconstruct ourselves, our identity, our way of living, our practices, the way that we worship, where we put our hope, where we put our faith. We've got to reconstruct the whole thing. We need whole life renewal in order to recapture this invitation that Yahweh has invited us into that we no longer deserve. We never deserve to begin with, but we certainly don't deserve it now. And yet it's still available to us. So this chapter ends by saying that Josiah did all of this in order to carry out the words of the law that were written in the book that the priest Hilkiah found in the Lord's temple. Before him, there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his strength according to the law of Moses, and no one like him arose after him. How good is this story? You guys, it's so good. Amen, let's call the worship team back up. We're done. Like, it's so good. It's such a good story. We're going to tie it back to ourselves now. We are in a season of Lent and a series uh, about Lent called A Journey to Hope, where we're talking about um, what it looks like to reorient ourselves in the season of Lent towards the cross. And so you might be like, what does this 26-year-old king finding the book of the law teach us about Lent? If you've been following along with us, we've talked a lot about how Lent is really a time of repentance. It's a time of reordering our world in such a way that we're making some room to rediscover the goodness of God in ways that sometimes we've, we just forget. And we're so busy and life keeps going. We need a regular interrupting of our regularly scheduled programming so that we can be re-wowed by the goodness of our God. And so we've, we've invi- been invited in the season of Lent to reorient ourselves through a few different practices like prayer and fasting and so forth. I'm not sure that there is a better practice that leads to frequent, authentic repentance and reorientation of our lives than the practice of regularly reading God's word. The idea that we can practice the way of Jesus, that we can live out faith in Christ, that we can be obedient to the Father, that we can be in tune with the Spirit without regularly returning to the Word of God. At best, 
that is an incomplete picture of discipleship. At worst, it is a bold-faced lie designed to keep us from the word of God. Being in the word of God is essential to our transformation into Christ-likeness. It is essential for our witness, effective witness to a hurting world. It is essential to our being kingdom people in an upside-down place that can oftentimes be confusing. And so I want to give us three quick takeaways from this story of 2 Kings, where we can kind of take it and try to, how do we get this into our lives? The first is, do not neglect the word of God. Do not neglect the word of God. Especially today when we've got our Bibles on an app on our phone, which, hey, we are so privileged to have the holy word of God in an app on our phones. Like that kind of access to scripture over the course of history, like we are so privileged. And yet, it can make it feel so commonplace, so casual. We don't bring our Bibles places anymore because we've got it on our app. I'm guilty as well. I literally bring my Bible and I have it open on here when I'm preaching and then I forget it most of the time when I come because I have it on my phone. I'm not saying there's something wrong with that, but the casual nature with which we often approach the word of God, I think it it is something that we need to remember and take note of and think about. We don't want to be people who neglect the word of God. When we look back over the course of Israel's history, It feels like a fast decline because we're getting a bird's eye view. And yet, I I wouldn't be surprised because I've engaged with humans and myself being one for 40 years. Wouldn't be surprised if it was a slow drift over time. One compromise after one compromise, a neglect after neglect, until all of a sudden the way that we're making our decisions is based not on having met with and been spoken to by the word of God and the spirit of God, but my own intuition, my own hunches, my gut feeling, my heart, my emotions, my experience, all of which are corruptible, are they not? So we want to be people who don't neglect the word of God. When when we neglect God's word, we are all too often ruled by opinions, our own or someone else's. I've just noticed, uh, I I feel really grateful I have the opportunity to, to teach for Eternity Bible College, and I taught a class on this portion of scripture last semester, um, which was super fun, but I've just been blown away as we've gone slowly through the Old Testament in these courses that I'm teaching, um, how how much God is constantly responding to their making decisions based on their own personal assessment of what needs to be done and acting logically when he's often trying to do something miraculously. And as I've, as I've gone through this course with these, these courses with these students, I'm like, oh, I think that my ability to arrive at a logical conclusion is synonymous with God's will. Like, I assume that they're the same. Are, do you understand? And what if it's not the same? Am I considering that even as I make decisions? As I consider politics? As I consider really difficult cultural moments that we're in? Am I relying mostly on my own opinion or the opinions of those that I think I can trust or think are cool or whatever? If we neglect the word of God, we are far too easily ruled by opinions, whether it's our own or those of other people. We are also too easily ruled by desire. The desires of our flesh, we know from scripture and from human experience, are disordered. It is so easy to neglect to do the things that are good for us, as we talked about in the very beginning, right? And so our hearts are disordered, and we need the spirit of God to reorder the desires of our hearts. And so if we are making decisions based solely on our desire, they're corruptible and not always able to be trusted. We're also easily ruled by tradition and culture when we neglect the word of God. How many, no, I'm not gonna ask you. I know from personal experience, uh, interactions with both people like this and also my experience with having been a person like this, that when we root ourselves too firmly in our own tribe, our own tradition, our own way of following Jesus and assume no other way could possibly be valid or valuable, we run the risk of worshiping tradition over worshiping the Lord. And if the Lord then wants to challenge a tradition that is man-made, 
we've now put our stake so deeply and firmly in the ground that we're unable to respond to the, Lord correction, the Lord's correction. And so to neglect the word of God leaves us really vulnerable. And we don't like to think of ourselves as vulnerable, but it leads us really vulnerable to make really important decisions for our lives and our families and those to whom the Lord has entrusted us based on opinion, logic, reasoning, desire, all of these things, right? And the Lord can be at work in all of those. Those things are God-given. We are given, I believe we're given a gut, an instinct, an intuition, feelings, logic, reasoning. We're given all of those things as gifts. But all of those things are only a gift when submitted to the word of God. Apart from that, they can be in contention with it as we try to figure out how do we live this out in practical ways. Are you guys with me? What we learn from the story in 2 Kings is that a genuine desire to hear from God and a genuine openness to whatever he might want to say to us, even if it's difficult, even if it involves tearing some things down, uh, rejecting some things that feel so a part of our DNA, whatever it is that he might want to say to us, a genuine desire to approach God's word in that way, open and ready to be changed, it's enough to not only change our own lives, but to change the lives of those around us. We learn this from the story. And so the second takeaway we have from this is that God's word has a disrupting effect on a sincere heart. If you are someone who, are, who is regularly engaging with the word of God and it never disrupts your worldview, I might offer that you are reading your worldview into the text. The word of God is disruptive. It comes in and it divides. It, it gets in between joint and marrow and exposes what's going on in our heart if we approach it with a sincere heart and submit to it. And so it disrupts us. Through, through the, this disrupting effect, I think a few things happen. When we have a sincere heart and we approach God's word, a few things happen in, in maybe a somewhat predictable sequence if we are approaching it with a sincere heart. If I'm approaching the word of God every day like, Lord, I might read this and be like, got nothing. Or I might read this and decide I have to sell my house and everything that I own because you said something to me. If we're approaching the word of God like it might fall anywhere on that spectrum and I'm open, the word of God does a few things to us. When we approach the word of God with a sincere heart, there is a remembrance. We remember, oh yeah, God is good and he is for me and he has good things for me and I can trust him even in the hardest decisions even in whatever it is that he asks of me. And that remembrance leads us to a repentance. I've been so um, leaning on my own understanding, leaning on my own gifts and abilities, leaning on my own intellect and my own gut that I have forgotten to trust you. I've forgotten to mine this thing to figure out how do you want me to live my life and then to live my life that way. The next thing I think it does is it leads us to recommitment and renewal. That when we remember how good God is, when we remember what he invites us into, when we remember not only what he tells us to do and not do, but why he tells us to do and not do, we recommit. We repent, oh God, I've messed up. And then we do what Josiah did and we say, I, I, need, I need to realign myself. I need to, to recommit myself to what you've invited me to. I, I need the renewal that you are offering me because the way that I am going is not the way that I want to keep going. And so I, I need you to recommit yourself to me in the way that I need to recommit myself to you. And then the last one is response and reorientation. And so then we, we, like Josiah, we remember, oh, we remember who God is and we repent that we've fallen away or that we've made decisions based on our own understandings and we say, God, I want to recommit to going your way. And then we have to actually take action steps to do that. And what King Josiah teaches us is that, is he goes and his, his response to the conviction of the word of the Lord is to go and get to work, renovating the thing. Is search me, O God, search me, Spirit of God, and show me if there's anything in me that is not in alignment to you, and then give me the strength to actually go in and fix it and change it and go a different way. And maybe that looks like reevaluating the whole way that we've built our lives like it did for the people of Judah. 
What God's word is meant to do is teach us about the unmatched goodness of God and the surpassing worth of following Jesus. And then it invites us to reorient our lives in such a way that we are more freshly and clearly pointed at the way of Jesus than we were before. The last takeaway is that reading God's word has a ripple effect. It wasn't just Josiah whose life was changed But all those who Josiah's life had an impact on, all of those who were entrusted to him, all of those whom he led, all of them, their lives were changed because of what God did in the reading of the word for Josiah. Hearing the word of God had a whole life effect on King Josiah. It didn't just change what he believed, didn't just change the way he thought about life. It changed how he lived his whole life from then on out in such a way that it rippled out into the entire nation, creating this nationwide reform. This is what the Pentecostals call a revival. How many of you need to see a revival in your life? How many of you believe that we need to see a revival in our world today? Well, 2 Kings teaches us that it started with one person. With one person who encountered the word of God with a sincere and genuine desire to be changed by God, and it changed everything. Imagine a world where a small church like this took the Bible really seriously. Imagine if we believed that through it we would be exposed to the goodness of God and we would be exposed to the areas in our life that he still wants to bring healing and wholeness and flourishing and that we would trust him with those things and that the spirit of God would slowly over time change us to look more like Jesus in such a way that as we go out and live our ordinary lives at our workplaces, in our schools, in our homes, in our neighborhoods begins to have a ripple effect. This is what revival looks like. Sometimes, yes, maybe it looks like all of a sudden everyone's in a room and tongues of fire come on their head and they start speaking in tongues and these crazy things. Sometimes, yes, maybe. But it's not less than ordinary people encountering the word, encountering the word of God, remembering, repenting, recommitting, reorienting, and going a new way. It's not less than that. I think if, if we as a small church, if all of us begin to take the word of God seriously and decided I'm going to read it every day because I believe that God is at work in it and through it to change me so that I might be a part of blessing the world, if we did that regardless of how we felt about what we read and how we felt about making the time to do it, I think it would have a ripple effect far beyond any service project we could go out and try to do, any marketing campaign we could try to implement. It would change things. There's a lot of talk <clears throat> these days in the conservative church about uh, what, a, what threats there are to the church this day, these days. If we think about what is the biggest threat to the church of Jesus today, not just to its survival, to it, it withstanding the test of time, but to its health, the biggest threat to the health of the church, to the church looking like what Jesus invites us into. Maybe it's secularism, Maybe. Maybe it's polarization. Maybe it's individualism. What if the biggest threat to the people of God is not a threat against religious liberty or taking prayer out of classrooms? What if the biggest threat to the church today is apathy about the word of God? It was certainly a threat to Israel. It certainly changed the whole face of the people of the book to just be the people with no book? What if us not taking God's word seriously is the biggest threat to the church? What if the people of God forgetting the way of God, forgetting the goodness of God, forgetting the life that he invites us into, what if us putting this on a, in a storage room and leaving it there and then going out with whatever we can kind of remember and just making decisions based on our desire and our logic and our gut instinct and we leave that in a storage room getting dusty, what if that over time culminates in a people that look a lot more like the kingdom that Josiah inherited than, than the kingdom that the Lord invites us into? And so the invitation today is, one, go find your Bible at home, 
pull it off a shelf. But it's to decide to reorient. I'm going to invite the worship team back up. To reorient our habits and our practices and include space to read the word of God. And so part of our Lenten guide that you can find if you scan that QR code on your notes is some practices that we invite you to enter into. And one of those is a a Bible reading plan. This was a 45-minute way of telling you that we have a Bible reading plan for you. No. But there's a Bible reading plan on there, and we've, decided, we've uh, put it in place that if we started on Ash Wednesday and we go to Easter and we read through the Bible reading plan, it's two chapters a day, we would read all four Gospels by the time we get to Easter. It's pretty cool. If you have not done that at all, you're not behind. The, Lord, the Word of God is waiting to meet you. And so today is, I think, Mark chapter 9 and 10. Go home and read it. Tomorrow, wake up and read chapter 11. If you read two sentences and then your baby comes in the room and tries to rip your Bible and eat it and you get distracted and you don't get to go back, that's enough. It's enough. It's, it's, not, it's not that we want to have an expectation that we are going to become these people who have an hour of silence carved out every day to read God's word and have, a, have our Bible dictionary and our commentary. And we're going to, that's great if you can do that. I had a season of my life where I could do that. It was great. It could not be further from the season I'm in right now. And I'm having to recalibrate and figure out in this season, what does faithfulness to being in the word of God look like for me and my family? And so the invitation is before you to engage with the word of God, to not neglect the word of God, to eat it, to consume it, to let it be the bread of life, to let it feed you in a way that we are so desperately in need of. There is so much noise in our world. There is so much information. There is so much constantly, whether we're aware of it or not, that is trying to and successfully forming us into a certain kind of person. If we don't intentionally institute rhythms and habits and practices to allow God to reform us, our formation is happening whether we approve of it or not. And so we want to invite you this morning as we move into a time of worship, there's a few reflection questions on your notes. And so um, for you finding yourself in this message today, where are you at? Maybe you regularly read your Bible and it's your favorite practice that you do and this one is not an issue for you. If that is you, like non-sarcastically, slow clap for you, that's a great one. We've all got our, got our weak spots and the places that the Lord is inviting us to grow into. For most of us, this one's a challenge. It's a challenge to prioritize. It's a challenge to even believe that if we open this, we know how to read it and God's going to do anything with it. And the invitation is to do it anyways because we believe what God says. So there's some reflection questions for you on your notes. There's a, a team that's always back there where that receive prayer sign is that are ready to pray for you. It's confidential, no judgment. Um, I personally have, you know, Uh, invited these people to serve on this team because I trust them. I trust them with you all. And so we want to invite you, go get prayer if you need a safe place. If you just need to say like, I don't like the Bible and I feel bad about that, you can go say that to them and they'll pray for you. Um, But we want to respond. And so like King Josiah, we want to hear the word of the Lord and then we want to respond. And however that looks for you, whether you want to come up to the front and embody your response and kneel here or get prayer or sit in your seat or stand up and raise your hands, we're going to have a time of response through, through um, worship right now. And, and I want to pray for us as we move into that time. Um, Lord, I, I speak for myself and I know so many of my friends here when I say, we just want, um, we just want you. We just want a better way. Being human feels really hard, and you teach us that there is a better way to be human, and we see that modeled in the life of Jesus, and so we want to follow you into that life that you've offered us, and it's really hard to do. Our spirit maybe is willing, but our flesh is so weak, and um, I want to be someone who prioritizes all of the things that you invite me into, and yet um, children and work and bills and cleaning and friendships, all of these things um, compete for all of that time. And so we just need you to help us. Would you show us this morning if there's anything that you're calling us to lay down? If there's anything you're calling us to take up? If there's any amount of grace that you want to lather us with? If there's any amount of grace that you want to invite us to extend to ourselves? We just ask that your spirit would have your way in our hearts this morning as we worship you.
We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.